Well, hello, class. Welcome to Child Development. I am your professor, Professor Bryn, and you and I are going to go on a journey this semester, a journey through content in regard to infant, child, and adolescent development. It's my hope over the length of this course that you find out new things about yourself and other people, that you have more compassion for yourself and how you've become who you are and that you have ideas about how to mentor the generations that are underneath you. So whether you are a parent or a parent-to-be, or you're a soccer coach or a gymnastics coach, or you're the older sibling to some younger siblings, everyone in this class has someone that they are attached to and that looks up to them. So this class is going to give us empirical insights into the developmental process with the great hope that you're going to walk out after this class finishes knowing more about yourself and others and knowing more about attachment and play and teaching and creativity and connection and parenting and being able to mentor and nurture the generations behind us. We all have a responsibility to do that, right? So it'll be your job to take this material and bring it to life for where you can see yourself either now or later. And it'll be my job to walk you through foundational insights of developmental psychology. Every week we're gonna walk through a chapter or a particular content piece that allows us to know more about this process of development, which is a pattern of movement or change that starts at conception and continues throughout the lifespan. As I can imagine, this is your first lecture and your first week, and I know it's a lot to adjust to, but I hope that you can hear in my heart that I want you so much to enjoy this class and understand this material at a deeper level. You're going to have a lot of freedom in this class to research the things that matter to you, and I'm going to equip you to go deeper in those insights. So throughout this class, we're going to be challenged to integrate this information with our own person with our feelings and our logic and our thinking and our drives and motivations to integrate it into a whole brained understanding of how we develop and how other people develop around us a whole brained understanding of the developmental process for ourselves and other people and in this introductory chapter we're essentially going to lay out some of the key terms and key ideas that allow us to create a foundation on which we can build other concepts moving forward. Throughout these lectures, you're going to hear a lot of me. You're going to hear a lot of my heart and my vulnerabilities and my stories and the things that matter to me because this is how the material comes to life, you guys. We're not just vocabulary terms on a page to be processed and dissected. We're talking about real life kids and families and struggles and trials and growing up. And as you all know, you're in a transition yourself of a new semester and a new season of life and a new cultural surrounding all around you, right? So much is going on that it makes sense that we would be authentic with one another. We would acknowledge the things that are changing and we'd be able to see that through the lens of psychology. Psychology is the scientific study of human behavior and mental processes. With a developmental lens, we get to see how those mental processes and behaviors change over the lifespan. So you might have to listen to some of my social work stories or some of my growing up stories throughout some of these videos. And I hope you can see the heart behind it is that you don't forget that this material is connected to real life flesh and blood people. And I also hope that you try to take the material and connect it to your own family and your own upbringing and your own thoughts and feelings and behaviors where you take the material and you bring it to life. All right, with that being said, I am so excited for a great semester with you. Let's dive into chapter one. All right, one of the foundational questions of developmental psychology concerns this question of nature versus nurture. And so we want to talk a little bit about this as it guides and is one of the big questions in front of us. 
This question, of course, is much broader than developmental psychology. We know that other fields and other disciplines also ask questions about the biological basis or the environmental basis of human behavior and human culture and language and experience. So what is this question? This question has to do with the extent to which our development is influenced either by biological inheritance and genetic predisposition, which would be nature, or nurture, which has to do with parenting, culture, environment, generation, and the experience of the situation that you're in. How much of who you are is biologically derived and how much of who you are is the way that it is because of how your parents raised you or what your home life was like or what neighborhood you grew up in. As we'll see, there's a great interplay on many dynamics of who you are, characteristics, behaviors, personality, outcomes for you that are a connection and an interrelation between nature and nurture. And that that's a bi-directional relationship, that that's a relationship of mutual influence. That there are biological set points for you that create a thermostat under which you have sort of a parameter of growth or a parameter of change. But you can be at the top of your range with really good environments and good food and good upbringing and positive mentorship and good attachments, secure attachments. So we're going to see that there is an interplay between who you are as a biological creature and who you are as a human, social, connected to a time, date, and place, and other people creature. Formerly, it was sort of thought that children were totally passive, that they just were passively taking in the world and not having any impact on it. But the truth of the matter is, is children also impact environments. They also make choices within the environments in which they're placed. So we can also consider that the child is an active participant in this bi-directional process of nature and nurture. And you might ask a question like, how could a child take part in their nature? Well, let's imagine that biologically a child has a predisposition and a genetic predisposition towards being a little bit heavier. There's a constellation of genetic influence that has to do with some hormonal imbalances that have them and their thermostat for their weight is set, set a little bit higher than average. Maybe they inherited it from their family. Maybe it's a disfluency just in their genetic combination and who they are biologically. But let's imagine that we had a child whose genetic structure was just prone to being a little bit heavier. The thermostat or the scale set point is set a little bit larger for that child. The child also makes determinations at some point, depending on environment, right, about exercise and food choice and activity level. So even something biological like a genetic predisposition for some weight can be changed with the child making decisions and especially if the environment can support those decisions. Some homes don't have the finances to buy some of those more pricey, higher quality things on a consistent level where it might be easier to buy a whole bunch of pizzas or a whole bunch of ramen because that's just what the family can afford. Some homes will be very excited about physical activity and go hiking and go outside and go to the gym. And some homes don't have the resources or the family culture that supports those physical activity choices. So when we want to know why a certain pattern of behavior has developed or why a certain outcome has come to be developmentally, we know that nature and nurture are both going to have an influence, especially when a child gets old enough to start making some active choices for how they interact with their own biology and how they interact with their own environments. I like to think of it this way. You come to the world pre-wired with some set points that you inherit from your parents and the genetic combination of who they are. You have a unique combination of genetic structures and inclinations. Some might come to the world with genes for curly hair and other people might come to the world with genes for being quite tall and yet others might come to the world with 
genetic abilities for intellect or other higher order characteristics like personality, extroversion, agreeableness, creativity, empathy. So you'll come to the world with some preset characteristics and a range of characteristics. But the environment is also going to heavily influence whether those characteristics really get to shine or not. So a child might come to the world with a lot of the biological structures to be well-rounded and empathetic, but they might be raised in an abusive and difficult and neglectful environment. And those areas in the brain, when they're not used, they don't become more elegantly able to be used later. We call it use it or lose it. The neurons that fire together, wire together. That's why early experiences are so foundational to the biological and psychological creation of characteristics later in life. So this big question of nature nurture, I hope it gets you thinking on a really broad level about the influences that impact our behavior now and later. For me, when I see a slide like this, I'm reminded of how much power parents and caregivers and adults have to shape and protect and attach and teach children. Early on, the brain is so willing to connect and integrate and comprehend and understand and memorize things. It wants to know and engage with a world that's going to be safe and adventurous and creative. And that falls on the adults to create spaces under which kids can flourish. So it's important for us not to be overly deterministic or fatalistic about our biology deriving and sort of creating destiny for us. We know that nature and nurture are interrelated and interdependent, and we play a role in the development of the people around us. And we also play a role in our own development. So keep that in mind as we move forward. We also have a couple other really big questions concerning human development. And the first one is called the stability change issue. And this involves the degree to which our early traits and characteristics either persist throughout life, which would be stability, or change throughout life, which would be change. So if you're shy growing up, do you stay shy as an adult? Or do you grow into being an extrovert later? Was that trait of introversion, was it stable or was it prone to change? What about your height? Is that somewhat stable? What about your eye color? Um, what about your intelligence? And what's the interaction of nature and nurture on that stability or change? You can see that it's a complex interrelated process. And you know, this issue of stability and change is really important to think about. One of the things that I do outside of being a professor is that I'm a social worker in Riverside County. So I work with foster kids and their birth families and their foster families, and sometimes uh, their adoptive families if they're going to be adopted. And the whole point of what we do, of course, is that we want to create safer environments for kids to go back home to a healthier family. And if they're not able to go back home to a healthier family to find a forever home for those kids where they can continue their lifelong journey of growth and development and learning. As part of my job, I do foster parent classes. So I'm the person that certifies and teaches the certification class so that people that want to be a foster parent could be trained up to become a foster parent. And this very last weekend, I had a family and they were asking so many questions during training. And one of the questions that they were asking, because we were talking about personality, one of the really big questions that they were asking was this stability or change question. And you know, they wanted a very sort of quick and easy answer, but the quick and easy answer is that it depends. It depends what we do in the environments that we have, whether that's a third grade classroom or a dance classroom with a whole bunch of preschoolers where you're the dance teacher and you're teaching preschoolers ballet, or whether you're the foster parent working with Johnny on his homework to try to get him to the next grade level and sort of get him caught up, or whether you're the older sister 
that's mentoring your younger sister through her adolescence and through some of those moments of body image and Instagram and boyfriends and friends that are being bullies and weird things that are happening to try to figure out who they are. So certainly whether something stays the same or changes is going to largely depend on what environment we find them in, what season we find them in, and what characteristic we're looking at. Are we looking at their basketball skill? Or are we looking at their reading comprehension? Or are we looking at their empathy level or their social skill? Each of those domains is a different characteristic. So to go back to my foster parents question about stability or change, essentially they're asking a very vulnerable question. They're asking, does my time with Johnny matter? Is what we're doing right now training up to become better foster parents and to learn the rules and and know what we're doing, is it going to last? Is it going to create a change for Johnny? Is he going to be better off? Wow, that's a really earnest and a really good question. And it's a question I would ask to you guys too. Do you want to be better off in three months? Do you want to grow? Do you want the people around you to grow? Do you want to be able to tackle the next mountain that you have to climb with even more resilience and empathy and understanding and compassion and logic? Do you want to grow as well? I do. I certainly do. I want to change. I want to get better. So that's the heart of this foundational question. How much of what we're looking at in regard to traits or characteristics Is something that sets in place and stays in place and can't be changed? And how much of it can be altered and can change over time? Now, biologically, you might not be able to change your eye color. And biologically, there might be a height at which you can't really get any higher. So if you're hoping to become seven feet tall tomorrow, that probably won't happen tomorrow. That probably won't be something that changes that drastically tomorrow. But if you want to be a little bit more socially skilled or a little less anxious or have a better understanding of other people's emotions or get a better grade in a class or have a skill that you become better at, those things we can put some time into. Your brain plus a great environment plus you desiring to grow, we can put some time into those things and create some change. So does something stay the same or change? Well, the answer is it depends. If the characteristic or trait is something that is able to be changed, our biology wants to learn and grow. Our environments can support growth and development. And if we also have a growth mindset within ourselves to make active choices towards that change, absolutely, we have the possibility of change. Nobody is going to say that change is easy, but is it possible? Yes. So what's something that you'd like to change over the length of the semester? What's something in your life right now that could get a little bit better, that could get a little less distracting, that could be a little bit more balanced? I want you to think about that. You have the capacity for change. If you have the motivation and the good environment that allows it, you definitely have a brain that's creative enough that wants to make these connections and wants to move forward and and wants to integrate. It wants to make sense of the world around it. So put some thought into that question. I'll do the same and then we'll compare notes later, okay? Another really big question that is a foundational developmental psychology question has to do with continuity and discontinuity. This has to do with whether or not our development or the pattern of change that we see over the lifespan, whether it involves gradual cumulative change or abrupt distinct change. So one way to think about this is continuity is like a ramp. It is just a steady increase or a steady decrease or decline in into direction. A ramp is gradual. It has just sort of a slope, right? So there's little incremental changes over time. And that's what we would consider continuity. Now in discontinuity, what we're looking at is distinct stages or abrupt moments of sort of, aha, I've got it, where I advance rapidly and I'm now at a new level. 
You can think of it as the difference between a ramp, which would be continuity, and stairs or steps for discontinuity. There is a distinct place at which you take a step up to the next level and then another step to the next level. And there are these distinct levels where you go from not having the location of your foot at that level to actually stepping up and being now at a different level. And that would be discontinuity. That's a big question. And as you'll see in chapter one, we've got many different theories about the nature of development as being either continuous or having continuity or discontinuous and having discontinuity. So this leads us to chapter one's main point and main discussion and main theme, which is conveying the definition of developmental psychology, in particular, the lifespan perspective of developmental psychology. So development is a pattern of movement or change that begins at conception and continues throughout the human lifespan. For us as psychologists, we're going to be focusing on human behaviors and mental processes with a scientific, which means unbiased, objective, research-based approach of answering questions about why people do what they do, why they think what they think, and how they come to do what they do, behave, and how they come to think how they think. Human behavior and mental processes across the lifespan. Now the scientific approach to human behavior and mental processes is relatively new as a science. Even more so are our methods and our attempt to understand the developmental process from a scientific lens. Historically speaking, a lot of times kids weren't even really thought of as vulnerable or younger. They were just kind of not even really thought of. So it is certainly true that studying childhood and studying young adulthood and studying the teenage years and studying the entire lifespan is also relatively new to the field of psychology. So this lifespan approach is not just focusing on infants or not just focusing on school age kids, but acknowledging that the entire lifespan has important insights into human behavior and mental processes that are important to study. So why would it be important to study development over the lifespan? Well, first and foremost, I think that it's important to acknowledge that every person, no matter their age, has value, integrity, and worth. You know, you see some cultures that don't have a lot of esteem for their elderly, or you'll see some cultures throughout time that haven't really had a lot of protections for children. You know, even the idea of foster homes or foster care, they're relatively new to America. Having a child welfare system was something that is not always been in place. You know, kids were working in factories. They were getting injured in factories. There were orphan trains where if a kid wasn't wanted, a parent would just put the kid on a train and send it down to the next station. And maybe some nice couple in a farm in the next station would, would take a couple kids to be able to have them have them work the farm. Oh my gosh, right? So you can understand that it's not too long ago that even kids weren't really seen as tremendously valued. So it's important for us to have this lifespan perspective because we're seeing every age bracket as being uniquely vulnerable, uniquely strong, uniquely important, and worthy of respect encouragement, investigation, and examination into what every age group has to offer in regard to human life and development. So studying lifespan development allows us to have respect for the beauty of every person, regardless of their age. And once we know more, we're responsible for more, you know? So when we know that certain age brackets have certain developmental changes or vulnerabilities, we're now responsible to create classrooms and, and homes and parents and foster parents and coaches that are responsible with those insights. So when we know more about how people develop at different ages and we have respect across the lifespan, it really allows us to take more responsibility for doing those things, whether it's parenting, coaching, mentoring, or teaching, 
it allows us to do that with more responsibility, more knowledge, and more protection. And in that, when we learn about the lifespan, we also learn about ourselves and we have insight into our own lives and our own development. I really think that you guys will find many of these pieces of insight. I think you can apply them towards yourself and having insight towards your own experiences, whether that's current or past. So we study the lifespan because it shows respect across the ages. It allows us to have information about the human condition that makes us responsible for being better humans, right? For doing a better job with one another. And it allows us also to have insight, mindsight, and integration of our own life experiences so that we can do a better job for ourselves and others. Okay, so let's talk about the characteristics of the lifespan perspective. And before we do, let's acknowledge that that is a two and a half year old Bryn with Peter Pan at Disneyland picture on this slide. And so you get to enjoy that. Got to appreciate the hat looking, looking pretty fly as a two and a half year old. So let's walk through the characteristics of what makes the lifespan perspective viable, interesting, moral, important, and foundational to what we're going to be discussing in this class. The first characteristic is that the lifespan perspective views human development as lifelong. So this is something we talked about in the last slide, that our investigations are not narrowly focused on just certain age brackets, that we understand that all of the age brackets have something of worth to examine and understand more fully. And all of those ages, from the time you're born to the time you pass away, have value and are worthy of research and understanding. All right, so the next characteristic is that the lifespan perspective is multidimensional. This is something that's mirrored, of course, in your textbook. So starting in the next chapter, we start to see that every chapter is going to have different domains of developmental focus. So these multiple domains or dimensions, broadly speaking, have to do with biological, cognitive, social, and emotional development, as well as the subtopics or subcomponents underneath each of those major domains. So when we say the lifespan perspective is multidimensional, we're talking about it's able to be focused on different domains of development, biological, cognitive, social, and emotional. If you keep that in mind, you'll read your textbook a little bit different because you'll see that every chapter is going to focus on one or two domains. Biological, cognitive, social, emotional. The lifespan perspective is also multidirectional. This has to do with many things in your life. Some of them grow and expand, and some of them diminish or prune or get redirected. And this is a really important thing because this has to do with components in your life, both growing and contracting in their skill, in their importance, and in their focus. I think another way of thinking about this is that there's plenty of things in your life that in different seasons take importance, where you have to really focus on a certain skill to be able to give focus to it. Now, in regard to your gross motor skills, early on in your life, it's very important for your core muscles and your gross motor skills to enable you to sit up and to focus your core muscles on being able to sit up and hold your head up and not fall over. Wow, growth for you at those early stages involves putting a lot of time focusing on the ability to sit up. But most likely, obviously, wherever you're at right now, you're sitting up and you're listening to this lecture and you don't have to focus on growing the ability to sit up. You've already got that. So you don't really have to grow that skill anymore. You have it and you're focusing on other skills and other things. So development is multidirectional. There's going to be seasons that inspire growth of a particular thing and it gets focused, focused, focused on growth of that particular skill. And in later seasons, especially after that skill has either been obtained or it's not really necessary anymore, your brain doesn't have to grow that skill anymore. You don't get to focus on that skill. You go in a different direction. It is multi-directional. 
correspondingly, another facet of the lifespan perspective is that your development is seen as plastic or having plasticity. Plasticity is the capacity for your brain to make new connections and to change. It's the ability for your brain to grow and mend and heal. On a broader level, plasticity has to do with the capacity to learn and grow. We see this insight time and time again about the brain's capacity to make connections. You'll hear this term and it's, it's mentioned in the whole brain child, but neurons that fire together, wire together. This means that experiences with music and sound and empathy and caregivers, the experiences that we have early on, especially when the brain is tremendously plastic and tremendously able to make those connections and keep those connections and grow those connections, that the early moments especially are tremendously important for the growth of the brain. And the brain is going to grow in the direction of the experiences that it has. So think of it this way. If you have a friend that is with you all the time that complains a lot and they have a lot of negative affect, don't think that your brain is unaware of that environment. Neurons that fire together wire together. The environments that you choose teach your brain how to make connections. So if you want to start making some more growth mindset connections, you're going to need to put yourself in an environment that has a better readiness and a better context for those developmental processes. I'm sure you've probably heard before that many people, when they want to recover from an addiction or get out of a pattern, a bad behavior pattern, they often have to have a completely new friend group and they need to not go back to the same places where they were. Well, that's because your brain is really sensitive to habit and really sensitive to context and context primes connections and primed connections can prime behaviors and, and prime or influence behavior patterns that are harder to break. So if you want to do a new thing, you got to give your brain some new connections and some new inputs. And speaking of inputs, another lifespan perspective, a characteristic of it is that it's multidisciplinary. This research gets done by many different fields, subfields, researchers, and departments. We're talking about psychology, sociology, biology, public health, education, neuroscience, anthropology, criminology, uh, the medical sciences, art, creativity, teaching. There's many, many different places and domains and disciplines of thought that are interested in understanding the lifespan perspective and understanding people's development over the lifespan. Another characteristic of the lifespan perspective is that it's contextual. This has to do with context or setting. So this could be a big setting like a generation or a nation, or this could be a small setting like a classroom or a club or a family home. Obviously, each setting is also influenced by the bigger settings around it. So your neighborhood is influenced by the state and region and city that you live in. And the city that you live in is influenced by the nation that you live in, which is influenced by the year that you're born and the political and socio-historical factors that are going on in your life at the time that you're born and time that you're living. So there's also obviously historical and social and economic and cultural and subcultural factors that play a role in how your development is also influenced by context. And your textbook also reminds us that this development is a process and this process involves growth, maintenance of that growth and coping with or regulating yourself on things that have changed or things that have been lost. So there's a push pull between these motives of growing, maintaining, or regulating and recovering from change. As we age and we move through different seasons of life, those goals are going to constantly be interacting with one another. As we try to get to the next season of our life and maintain our identity and recover from what just changed, that growth, maintenance of growth 
and regulation of loss are the factors and goals and set points for our human development. So whether you're trying to grow into something like getting your driver's license or starting a new job, or you're just in college trying to maintain and just keep doing what you're doing, or you're trying to cope from something that has changed or recently been lost or edited in some way, the loss of a relationship, the changing of a friendship, moving to a new town, that you're trying to cope from those changes, you will find that every season of your life will have some combination of growth, maintenance, and coping with change or regulation of loss. So here's a question for you right now. What's something in your life that you're trying to grow into? What's something in your life that you're just trying to survive with or maintain with? And what's something in your life that you're trying to cope with or understand or recover from? All right, so we talked in the last slide about how one of the factors of the lifespan perspective is that it's contextual. So contextual obviously means that context matters in regard to development. Well, there are three types of contextual influences that are noted in our chapter, and let's walk through these right now. Okay, so let's talk about normative age-graded influences. Normative means normal, age-graded means by age group. So this means that these are influences that are similar for individuals within a similar age group. So whether you're a preschooler learning your alphabet, or a 16-year-old learning how to drive, or a 17-year-old graduating from high school, or you're 65 and going into retirement. Those are similar experiences within those age brackets. They're normative, they're normal. Another type is normative history graded influences. And that has to do with generational effects or historical circumstances. This has to do with similar contextual influences because of the year that you were born or the socio-historical circumstances that are prevailing around you at the time. Those influences very much say, hey, listen, different people experience the world at different setting points and different times. Whether you were here for 9-11 or World War II or you were born in the baby booming era or you're a millennial, you're going to have a different experience by way of generational and historical circumstances. When we say normative, we mean that the generations have some normative similarities that are common to them because of their upbringing and because of their generational experiences. And you see this a lot in the differences in how different generations think, right? You see different age brackets think in certain ways, and that makes perfect psychological sense when you think of the fact that different generations very much experienced the world and grew up and developed in the world in formative years in prevailingly different circumstances. That's going to have a huge impact on how they vote, behave, pray, go to church or don't go to church, how they use their dollars, how they see the world around them. Of course, the way that you were raised and the circumstances under which you were raised are going to have an influence on you later. Those are normative, history-graded influences. And our third category of contextual influences has to do with non-normative life events. So non-normative means that this doesn't happen for everybody. This would be a life event that's an unusual occurrence, but still has a huge impact on an individual's life. This can be a trauma, yes, or it could be a triumph. So let me give you some examples. So a non-normative life event might be something like a tornado that hit your home when you were a little girl or that you became sick in high school and missed one of your years of high school going to medical visits. That didn't happen to everybody. It happened to you. It's non-normative. It's not everybody that experienced it. 
So a tornado or an illness might be a trauma. This is something that's unique to you and it has had an impact on the way that you grew up and developed moving forward. But it can also be a triumph. So it could be your parents getting a better job in a different town and it moves you out of where you're at and you now have more responsibility and more resources and better connections. So it, it can be a trauma like an illness, but it could also be a triumph like an opportunity. Safer environment, more focus on school, that could, that could change a lifetime. That could change the direction of where they're going because of contextual influence. So non-normative life events can be either traumas or triumphs, and they both have an impact and can have an impact on an individual's life. Within this discussion, we're also very aware of the impact of culture, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, identity, and orientation. Broadly speaking, we know that there's so many facets to what makes a person who they are. And those facets have an influence on the other facets, and they certainly have an impact on human behavior and mental processes. So no discussion of human development can miss out on these areas of influence. You'll have different fields and subfields and disciplines that are going to focus on particular aspects of influence. Sociologists will often focus on culture and how group members will influence the behavior of other group members within a culture and what that looks like across subculture, culture, and generation. Different disciplines or areas within developmental psychology might focus on the facets and influence of ethnicity on human development, where a person's heritage and characteristics are broadly used to understand and explain their development and how they come to be who they are. Other disciplines and research directions will focus on social policy and social welfare, trying to determine how to lift people up from circumstances that are disequitable into equitable circumstances where they have a fair shot of receiving resources and achieving what they want to achieve. We see this area of influence as having a huge influence, socioeconomic status. And socioeconomic status has to do with occupational, educational, and economic characteristics. It's not just money. It's also position, status, resource, aspiration. So it has to do with the whole culture of status, essentially. And I think it's important to say, of course, is that the people that are at the lower end of socioeconomic status are at like an extra disadvantage. Not only are they already lower in resources or maybe the finances of the home, but there's less status, less opportunity, the occupational leverage or the ability to advance might be lower. They might even, because they feel like they're at the bottom, they might feel like not trying. And certainly one can see how being lower on socioeconomic status can put a person at an extra disadvantage. So I work with foster kids and not all of them come from backgrounds of poverty, but many of them do, which is an extra disadvantage for them, right? So let's imagine I'm working with Johnny and Johnny is three years old. His mom is 21 and she had him removed from her care because she got in a really big argument with her mom and the police came and they found that this 21 year old mom, uh, she was high. She was extremely high on meth at the time. They checked the house out and the house is not safe. The environment's not safe. And little Johnny is taken to a foster home. So let's just have some compassion for Johnny's mom for a second. If she was really rich, she could pay to go to a recovery center and she could move to a better part of town and she could move away from her mom because her mom makes her angry and they don't have a good dynamic and it's not working out. So with resources, this mom could move to a better part of town, move away from her mom, get clean and go to therapy and deal with some of the things that happened in her past that are impacting her current life and her current ability. She could do parenting classes so she could get away from the influences that she has. 
And she wouldn't have to work so much and do so many odd jobs and try to make ends meet because with some resources, she would have more ability to parent him and focus on him. But if she doesn't have a whole bunch of money and has to therefore live with her mom and also has to work several part-time jobs and she's got some issues that really need worked on but she doesn't have the money to go have them worked on and worked through, you can imagine that that's like an extra disadvantage for her and Johnny, right? So at least in my work, what we're trying to do is address some of those issues by way of giving those resources to that mom. Johnny is placed somewhere safe, but also the whole heart behind it is that Johnny's mom, we'd get her those parenting classes. We would get her to that sober living facility and get her sober. We would do some therapy with her and her mom to deal with some boundaries and some issues and get her and Johnny to a place where they're reunited in a healthier home and a healthier context. I think sometimes people that have had a lot of resources, they don't realize what it's like to not have enough money, enough gas money to get to the store. They don't know what it's like to worry about paying a bill so that there's lights on in the house. They don't worry about sending their kid to soccer camp or that extra field trip that costs $6 or having the $6 to send Johnny to SeaWorld for the day with the, with the classroom, right? So yeah, if you came from money or you came from a little bit of money or came from no money, you know that what I'm saying has an impact on your development and your options and your resources and your growth. And certainly speaking of resources and development and growth, we know that your gender, your gender identity, your orientation, and how you fit into or don't fit into the context that you're in, those other aspects of self have a huge impact on development as well. So on this slide, you essentially see the research of many different fields and many different perspectives, trying to have an understanding of a big, big gestalt, a whole picture of human development. Each of these pieces play a role, and each of these pieces are in some degree focused on by different researchers. So you're not gonna have one researcher do all these things deeply all at once, but you'll have different domains, different disciplines, and different researchers studying these issues so that we can add all of our findings together to know how these areas of influence, these multiple areas of influence, have an impact on human development. In this next slide, you see the multidimensional aspects of human development, biological, cognitive, and social-emotional. As I mentioned before, each chapter has a different multidimensional focus. So some chapters will be biological in focus, others will be social emotional in focus, and that'll be different across the different age brackets that we walk through. In this class, we're gonna walk through, unit one has to do with infancy. So that's gonna be conception all the way through to around 24 months, so conception to about two years old. That'll be our first unit in this class. In the second unit in this class, we'll walk through preschool all the way through elementary school. And in the final unit of our class, we'll essentially walk through junior high through high school. And throughout the way, in each age bracket, we'll walk through biological processes, cognitive processes, and social-emotional processes. Part of my hope for you in this class is that you'll be able to really dive into a dimension and do some research on a subtopic within an age bracket, within an issue, and learn a lot about the developmental process within that domain. So whether it's social media usage for teenagers or autism for elementary school students or prenatal care for moms-to-be, no matter what you're focusing on age bracket wise, you're gonna focus on different dimensions, biological, cognitive, social, or emotional, doing some research and knowing those things at a deeper level. You're always gonna hear encouragement from me, by the way. I want you to research stuff that matters. I don't want you to waste your time in this class. I want you to research stuff that actually matters. Make a difference. Learn something about yourself and others that's relevant. Prepare for your future. Do research on the stuff that connects with what you're going to be doing. 
Don't waste a moment in my class. Make a connection with where you're going and where you've been so that we can do some good, right? Okay, so let's move to the next slide. This has to do with the timelines of development. Your book talks about four different types of age. And I think this is a nice way of mentioning and showing us that age is not just how old you are in your body. Okay. So let's talk about these different classifications. Chronological age has to do with how many days you've been alive. It is the chronos. It is the time that you've been alive. So this is your birth date and how many days you've been alive. This is your chronological age, your age in time. Your biological age has to do with your physical fitness, cardiovascular fitness, and your physical function of your body, your biological health. This has to do with susceptibility to illness or vulnerability to illness and disease. This has to do with longevity. This has to do with heart rate, life expectancy, vision, sensation, perception, brain function. So this is the physical fitness of your body. Now you can imagine that your chronological age and your biological age could be different. All right, so let's imagine a 15 year old gymnast and she's 15 in her chronological age. That's how many days that she's been alive, but she goes to the gym six hours a day. She trains every day, all day. She's, she's in great physical shape. Her heart function, her brain function, and even since she's exercising so much, she might not even menstruate. So even though she's 15 years old in her chronological age, she might have the physical fitness of someone that's younger because of those adaptations and the physical fitness that she has on her system, her biological system. So you can see that the chronological age just gives you some idea of where they're at and how old they are, but the biological age doesn't have to match the chronological age. Let's add another layer to this example. Psychological age has to do with an individual's adaptive capacities compared to those of people in the same age group. In some ways you could think of this as adaptability, coping skill, street smart, logic, survival skill, right? So a three-year-old, just so you know, a three-year-old doesn't have a lot of logic or street smart. And they also are not very adaptable. I don't know if you've ever tried to take a three-year-old from a playroom and then be like, we've got to leave now. Let's go. We've got to leave the birthday party. It's like, um, I'm not adapting to change very well. This is now where I will have a tantrum and fall on the floor. So three-year-olds don't adapt to change very well, right? They, they need the routine so badly. They don't make a quick shift. Um, so psychological age has to do with cognitive adaptability as well as street smart of being able to kind of cope and deal with change deal with life when it changes. You know, these questions of being able to deal with problems and address problems. So somebody that's older and more mature and more discerning is going to have an older psychological age because they have more wisdom. They have more experience. They have more adaptability of, oh, I've seen this situation before. Here's how, here's how we adapt to it. Here's how we act. So let's imagine our gymnast again. She's 15 in chronological age. She's younger in her physical fitness age, but let's imagine that she's just been training and training with adults since she was three. She knows a lot of adult things. She hangs around adults and coaches all the time. She homeschools and she's very smart. And so she might be 15 in her chronological age, younger in her biological age, but older in her psychological age because she just spends time with adults all the time. And she's very professional and very discerning and, and very psychologically advanced. Social age, as you can imagine, has to do with level of connectedness and affiliation and intimacy and social support with other people, especially given the social roles that that person adopts and is part of. So social age would have to do with stuff like 
intimacy, discernment, social skill, empathy, nurture, closeness with others, communication ability, ability to connect with others, long lasting relationships, conflict resolution. We'll go back to the example of the three-year-old. A three-year-old has a very young social age because at three, they can barely kind of just do their own thing, let alone be a good friend to someone else. Like if that friend has a toy that they have, it might be really hard for them to be like, wait, I like Johnny. I don't want to grab Johnny's Paw Patrol. I will wait because I'm a good friend and I have a good social relationship with him. Three-year-olds don't think that, right? So social age has to do with the maturity of social relationships, social roles, and social understanding. So let's go back to our gymnast. Our gymnast could be 15 in chronological age, younger in biological age because she's so physically fit. She could be older in psychological age because she's really just had to professionally and cognitively and adaptively advance. And depending on her level of intimacy and closeness and connection and trust and affiliation and belonging, she might be older in her social age with her family, coaches, teammates, and friends, depending on what her life looks like at that time. So when we study development, we know that just studying someone's birth date doesn't tell us the full story on every aspect of who they are. All right, so let's move forward a little bit to talk about methods for collecting our data. Now, since psychology is the scientific study of human behavior and mental processes, that means that the research methods that we try to ascertain answers to our questions about human behavior and mental processes, those processes and methods have to be scientific. By scientific, we mean that our methods have been unbiased, objective, and hopefully reliable in the sense that what we've done has been without subjective bias, opinion, or slant. Some methods for collecting data involve observation, survey and interview, standardized test, case studies, and physiological measures. In regard to observation, the preferred place for observation is a laboratory. And you can imagine why. In a laboratory, this is a more controlled setting. There are less noise variables. And by noise, I mean not only actual noise, but I mean irrelevant or competing stimuli. So in a laboratory, we're able to control some of the factors that could interrupt our assessments. One application of this observation approach and laboratory approach is a technique called parent and child interaction therapy. This is a specialized type of parent training and you can look it up. It's really, really cool. It's called PCIT or parent child interaction therapy. In parent child interaction therapy, what will happen is the parent will go in the room and this is a laboratory. So the room is set up. It's got the toys. It has the table. It has, has a place ready to be observed. There is a window which the researcher can talk to via monitor, in-ear monitor, talk to the parent and give the parent strategies and goals and direction about how to interact with their child. Um, oftentimes this type of therapy is used with parents that either need the help or they have children that have some behavioral problems or issues. Uh, Parent-child interaction therapy is usually done with littler kids. I've had it done with the kids on my caseload as young as two and three. And what a cool thing to give training, real life training under controlled circumstances to a mom that's trying to learn how to navigate a tantrum or how to engage with her child in a more positive way. Sometimes parents are difficult with their kids because their parents were difficult with them. They haven't really had any training, any learning. They really haven't had any good mentorship or good teaching experiences about what a good parent does and says and what they sound like and how they problem solve and how they deal with conflict. So something like parent-child interaction therapy is something that's birthed out of the observation method, especially in a laboratory, but has been used empirically 
to be able to create training that helps parents become better in engaging with their kids and managing their kids' behaviors. Now, that's not to say that sometimes naturalistic observation or observing behavior in a real-life environment is not something that is useful and important. In a real-life setting, we're able to see a more truthful representation of what the behavior is in that particular setting. Your textbook on page 27 has an example of a study that I think is very useful for you to take a look at. So as a social worker, I often supervise visits between birth family members like mom and dad or grandma and the child that's on my caseload, so Johnny and his mom. Sometimes those visits take place at my office and my office has the windows, it has the baby gates, it has the toys that are already there. That's more like a laboratory, right? It's more of a precise setting, a controlled setting. But if we were to have that same visit at a park, wow, it's a totally different visit setting, right? It's a little less controlled and there might be other kids on the slide and there might be other parents nearby. So you have two observations and two visits in two very different locations and you're able to see and observe different behaviors. Both of them are very useful, right? And from observation, we can get motivation for future research. Surveys and interviews are very frequent within developmental research, as are standardized tests or assessments. Physiological measures like heart rate, blood pressure, genetic structure, hormone level, eye tracking or sort of eye movement, or even fMRI like brain function, those are also very fascinating and flourishing areas within developmental psychology, especially developmental neuropsychology. And occasionally you might have a unique circumstance or a unique child or a unique person that you would do an in-depth case study looking just at their life. Now all of these methods for collecting data not one of them together can tell you the full picture. And that's why science advances with a multitude of scientific methods collected with as much precision and objectivity as possible from multiple sources, multiple researchers, multiple different times, dates, and places give us a fuller picture of developmental progress. Your book talks about three different research designs, descriptive, correlational, and experimental. I want to review them just very briefly. Many of the methods that we just talked about involve descriptive research. This is research that is designed to observe and just record behavior. You're going to be able to see patterns and frequencies and general layout of behaviors, human behaviors, but really not be able to have a lot of causal or associative conclusions that you can come to. So descriptive research is our first layer of just starting to collect some patterns and collect and observe some ideas of what's going on and what's possible. Correlational research gets us a little bit deeper into understanding the interrelationships between variables. Correlational research allows us to know the co-relation between different variables. It allows us to describe the strength of relationship between these two variables or events or characteristics. And from our co-relational research, we get a correlation coefficient. And that's a number that ranges from negative one to positive one. And it allows us to know the degree or strength of association between two variables in such a way as things that have a correlation of zero, they're not co-related. They don't predict one another. They don't have a co-relation. If something has a correlation of 0.4, for example, and it's in the positive direction, that means that reliably and statistically, we know that as one variable goes up, the other variable also goes up at a somewhat moderately strong level. So correlation starts to give us information about connections, correlations and connections. Now correlational research only tells us that two things are either going together or going in the opposite direction or not, not associated at all. It does not yet give us 
causal information for us to know about causal relationships between variables we need to use the third research design which is experimental research experimental research as many of you know is where we're able to determine and demonstrate cause and effect relationships in an experiment one or more of the factors are manipulated while all of the other factors are held constant this allows us to see whether or not that factor that one different factor was causally influencing and affecting our outcomes on other variables. In an experiment, you're going to have independent and dependent variables. The independent variables are called independent because they're independent of the participant. The participant doesn't pick what level of the independent variable they get. And I'll get back to that in a second. The dependent variable is often the outcome variable, and that is dependent on the participant's behavior or mental processes. So you think of the independent variable broadly as being proposed cause, and dependent variable as being proposed effect or outcome. In an experiment, you're gonna have an experimental group that has the levels of the independent variable in it, and a control group that basically is exactly like the experimental group except for that one factor, that one independent variable. So let's imagine that we're interested in seeing the impact of prenatal meditation or prayer time on a newborn's later sleeping patterns later in life after delivery. In this experiment, the independent variable, the potential cause would be that meditation or prayer time, right? So the independent variable for this example has a group that gets the meditation or prayer time intervention and a group that does not get that meditation or prayer time intervention. Our dependent variable or outcome is after the babies are born, we are able to assess and look at the dependent variable of breathing and sleeping patterns for these newborn babies. So if we have randomly assigned our pregnant mamas to either the experimental group that gets the meditation intervention or the control group, and it's random, so we're not just putting all the older mothers in the meditation group and the younger mothers in the control group, but it's random. You are a pregnant mom and you could have been in either group assigned to either the experimental group or the control group. If we have randomly assigned our participants to experimental and control groups, they have equal likelihood of having received the independent variable, which in this case is the meditation intervention, or being in the control group, which has nothing, just like normal. If there are differences later on on the newborn breathing and sleeping patterns, and those differences are statistically significant, we have the beginning of some information about a causal relationship between our intervention and the outcome or the dependent variable on our child. Now, one study wouldn't end this issue for all time. Science advances on the basis of multiple studies from multiple researchers with similar methods ascertaining what the truthfulness and what the boundary lines of the cause and effect relationships are. So it's important to remember, descriptive, correlational, and experimental designs, they all advance science all at the same time. We're having multiple scientists in multiple disciplines and fields in different locations with different cultures and subcultures, all trying to understand developmental patterns and processes from different perspectives. And science advances slowly, but also as a community it develops together. Science advances when all of these sources together share their insights, assess one another's insights, and try to replicate one another's insights to see if what we're seeing is accurate. What are the differences? What are the similarities? What are the new ideas? What are the new patterns? And philosophically for a second, I just want to appreciate how cool that is on, on a more meta level. That means that one scientist doesn't answer every question for all time and all purposes ever. That it's multiple scientists across 
across a span of time in multiple time dates, places, and generations that builds a body of understanding. The application, at least for me, is that when I get overwhelmed about my own life and, and my purpose and my meaning and what I'm doing in my profession, I don't have to teach everybody at the university all at once. I just have to take 25 students at a time. Hi, hello class. We just take our group at a time and we just do what we can one semester at a time, right? And the same is true for you. You don't have to do all the things. You just have to do your little piece right now. And with other people, we'll add our pieces together and try to make something good. Okay? If we're talking about research, we also need to address the special concerns of developmental research. And that involves the time span of developmental research. So let's talk about two broad approaches um, that have different time spans and some examples of those. Cross-sectional research, which is the quickest to collect, is that you collect information from individuals of different ages simultaneously. So you could collect, you could go into an elementary school and give a personality survey and a life satisfaction survey to the first graders, the third graders, and the fifth graders. So you've collected, in one afternoon, you've collected those three age brackets, right? That's a cross-section of each age bracket. Cross-sectional approaches are very common because they are the easiest to implement and we're able to analyze the data right now. So let's do another example. Let's imagine that I'm doing a life satisfaction survey and a relationship survey with fifth graders, college students, and retirees. If I see differences in life satisfaction and social relationships between those groups, some of those differences might be due to cohort effects or effects that have to do with a person's time of birth, era, generation, and the culture of that generation rather than actual age. So one of the problems of cross-sectional research is that there could be a potential confound in our interpretation between age effects and cohort effects. The only way that we really know how to deal with cohort effects is by doing longitudinal research. Longitudinal research studies one cohort at a time though. So it really focuses in on one group of people and studies the same individuals over a period of time, usually several years. One of the drawbacks, of course, of longitudinal research is that it takes a really long time to do. It's costly, it's expensive, people drop out, and sometimes you're not so sure if the people that have stayed in the study are somehow different than the ones that have dropped out. You can only study one cohort at a time, so you're not really studying different generations, you're studying one generation over time, so your age differences are going to be within that particular cohort or generation. They're going to be particular to that cohort. Now, as tricky as it might be to have that data and collect that data, that data is so rich and such a, such a great place for information on development. A couple examples for you to look into would be the Terman data set of high functioning, high intelligence people and also the Harvard study of adult development that began in 1938 and followed men and their families across generations. This is all to say that research in developmental psychology and in general takes tremendous conceptual, ethical, and problem-solving ability. Many considerations and special considerations for human participants go into us crafting and developing and executing studies, research studies in psychology. In developmental psychology, we have the added layer of concern for children participants. Our children participants are under the same protections as our adult participants. The difference, of course, is that they themselves can't give consent to participate. So they need parents and caregivers to give that legal authority and that ability. 
And since scientists uphold a standard of wanting to search for truth and uphold truth and find out real things, right? then it's even more important for scientists to also at the same time have an ethic for protecting the participants that are involved in that search for truth. So as we continue our search for understanding and being able to know more about the developmental processes and patterns of humans, we want to end this lecture with a review of the major theories of human development. For those of you that are psychology majors, this is going to be a little bit of a review. But for those of you that are joining us from different backgrounds, take a look at these different perspectives. They see human nature and they see psychology and they see human development and behaviors in different ways with a different perspective. And really, ultimately, it's all of these perspectives together that allow us to advance our understanding of human development. So don't really be thinking about which one's right or wrong. Take a look at each perspective as a different color in the palette of painting a big picture. These are just different colors of a really big painting of human nature. So let's start with the psychoanalytic theories. We'll have Freud and Erickson. So psychoanalytic theories are attributed to Freud. Sometimes you'll see the term psychodynamic, and psychodynamic really has to do with the people that followed Freud that were trained up in psychoanalysis or trained under that particular type of understanding. And the psychodynamic perspectives are the ones that came from Freud or followed Freud. So we'll just call this psychoanalytic for our purposes, but you can understand that it's broadly called psychodynamic now. And in psychoanalytic theory or psychodynamic theory, what we're seeing is that there's a large emphasis on human nature as being compelled by and influenced by under the surface, unconscious motives, emotions, and drives. That who you are is not all consciously, logically at your disposal to understand that there are things underneath the surface of your mind outside of consciousness, they're unconscious, they're underneath the conscious level that drive your behavior and your actions and your feelings. And that those drives are at least to Freud somewhat self-satisfying in nature. Freud's theory, which you've probably had some exposure to, really was a provocative idea at the time. Freud was a neurologist in Vienna in the 1800s. He had patients coming to him that had physical symptoms with no physical cause. And he started talking through these problems with a lot of his clients. Many of them were female. And he found that this talking cure started to alleviate some of their physical symptoms by talking about some of these conflicts in deep places in a methodical slow, deep way that those physical symptoms would start to go away. And through these talking sessions, he develops this idea of the unconscious and the three-part personality, id, ego, and superego. For our purposes in developmental psychology, we're going to find it to be particularly important that Freud is one of the first people to acknowledge that early childhood experiences had an impact on later adult development. At the time, kids in childhood weren't really studied or given that much thought. They were just kind of like little adults. But what Freud was saying is that these early experiences were formative. They were crucial to later development. And that problems at any particular stage growing up would have a person fixate at that particular stage and not be able to advance further. So he proposed that there actually were stages of psychological development. And those stages correspond with different age brackets, especially early on age brackets. That conflict early on and the lack of resolution of that conflict early on 
could create problems later for an adult. So his insights on early childhood influences on later development, just that by itself is very, very useful to the progression of developmental psychology. So what are Freud's stages? In the first stage, which is the oral stage, an infant is focused on essentially the mouth. And this corresponds to this idea of being fixated with breastfeeding or connection with a caregiver and getting that need met for food. So in the oral stage, which is birth to around one and a half years old, the primary goal and satisfaction goal has to do with receiving nourishment from the breast or breastfeeding. That pleasure comes from eating. That soothing comes from eating. That comfort comes from eating. If a child is either withheld from that level of satisfaction or withheld from the breast or withheld from the bottle, or overly fed or overly compensated, what Freud would say is over or under, if the need is not reliably and completely met, it's resolved in this stage, a person later on will have an oral fixation. They'll be fixated on stuff in their mouth, cigarettes, lollipops, eating, overeating or undereating, right? Because a fixation can go in either direction. And that seeing oral fixations in an adult later allows Freud to know where some of the conflict came from early on. His other stages follow a reliable pattern of that same conflict and need moving to different regions or zones or erogenous zones, he would say. In the anal stage, that's focused on the anus and being able to potty train. So that's focusing on holding or excreting your waist and the pleasure that comes from, from being able to do that. If someone has not resolved this potty training time well, what happens is essentially either anal expulsive, so that's like an explosive personality, or anal retentive, which means you're very rigid and kind of holding yourself in. Um, so a personality in adulthood that's anal retentive or anal expulsive would indicate some sort of conflict that took place in the anal stage, according to Freud. In the phallic stage, we're seeing gender identity start to develop by way of focusing on genitals and realizing essentially, gosh, boys have something and girls don't have something. What is that? So according to Freud, you'd see in the phallic stage some concern about castration anxiety or the penis going away or being emasculated. And for women, what Freud would say is that there would be penis envy that they would start to realize that they're different and they're missing something. So that stage either gets navigated successfully or fixations will happen. And those fixations can either be promiscuity in sort of an overindulged sense later or immature lack of sexuality or rigidity. So those extremes based on the genital stage not being resolved well. If you've ever heard anybody talk about being a mama's boy or a ladies man, or you've heard the term daddy issues, that's going to come from the phallic stage conflict. In the latency stage, it's almost like a timeout. Um, it's where boys and girls essentially, they hide and they put those sexual feelings under wraps. In the latency stage, Children are going to repress or hide or put under, under wraps those sexual feelings. A timeout period to focus on intellectual, social, and academic pursuits. School stuff. School time. You know that that's a time where boys and girls sort of have cooties and you'll see same-sex friendships cluster together. Girls rule and boys drool, that sort of stuff. So to Freud, if someone gets fixated and just sort of stuck in this stage, they stay in a very childlike, elementary school, self-focused, same-gendered pursuit. And the final stage to Freud is the genital stage. And that's where a person's affections will switch to outside people and to celebrities and rock stars and crushes where their sexual pleasure and connection with others are the driving forces. 
Freud believed that a person can be stuck in one of these stages if a parent was too strict or too lax within that stage. So fixation occurs when a stage starts to color or predominate the adult personality or their behavior later. Now, before you go disbelieving everything that I just said, let's see it for what it is. Intellectually speaking, what Freud did was really important by showing us that early childhood experiences and conflicts and drives and needs and things that can't be expressed deeper places were having an impact on adult development, behavior, and relationships. And for that, that progresses us and gives us some ideas to move forward. A follower and heavily influenced by Freud, a fellow researcher, Erickson, takes these psychodynamic approaches and moves this forward even more. Even this stage perspective, this discontinuity perspective of stages, Erickson continues it. And to Erickson, he actually thought that the need, the major need, was a social need or an affiliative need. So his stages are psychosocial stages, whereas Freud's stages are psychosexual stages. So to Erickson, what happens at every stage? In these stages, a person is faced with a crisis. Every stage has a crisis. Now, I want you to think of the word crisis as meaning opportunity or turning point because Erickson didn't mean crisis like you're thinking of crisis. When I say the word crisis, we all think of a terrible situation where things are going bad and it's harmful and difficult and dangerous. Crisis to Erickson wasn't like that. Crisis meant a turning point, a potential opportunity for change. Every stage has a potential turning point for change. And these stages are based on different needs, different psychosocial needs. You'll see on this slide here that I have the eight stages of psychosocial development. Throughout this course, we're going to go through the first half, essentially, of these stages. In our first unit, we're going to be covering especially that first stage, trust versus mistrust. In later stages, we're going to get ourselves into autonomy and doubt, initiative and guilt, industry and inferiority. And in our last stage, our last place in class, we'll talk about adolescence where the major crisis or turning point has to do with identity versus role confusion. And as Erickson has a lifespan perspective, we see that those stages and those turning points continue throughout the lifespan. So every age and stage to Erickson has a time, a turning point, a potential opportunity. It's a time of increased vulnerability, but also increased potential for change. Like Freud, if a stage is navigated successfully, the person goes on to the next stage with healthier resources. But if a stage is not navigated successfully, then the other stages after it are colored by the problem in one of those stages, one of the earlier stages. So your first stage, your first turning point has to do with trust versus mistrust. This is where you learn that caregivers and the world around you are either reliably, consistently, sensitively good and can be trusted, or that the world can't be trusted. I'm sure you can imagine how different the world looks like in the other stages after it, depending on whether you've learned to trust the world or not trust the world early on. Taking together Freud, Erickson, and these psychoanalytic or psychodynamic perspectives give us great insight into the importance of early conflicts on later development. All right, moving to our next big theory. Uh, this has to do with the cognitive theories. And the cognitive theories are going to focus on the development of complex thinking skills. Cognitive theories are focused on what a child knows, understands, comprehends, remembers, and computes. And 
a cognitive theory is not really going to be focused on unresolved conflicts. It's going to be focused on complex problem solving. So we have three approaches that we want to review, Piaget, Vygotsky, and information processing. But a little note here, you're going to see Piaget and Vygotsky again. So we're going to review them now, but you're absolutely going to see them in other chapters in this book. So let's start with Piaget. Piaget's perspective is that children are active detectives of trying to understand the world around them. They work hard to actively understand and construct knowledge about how things work and what things are and how to behave and how to problem solve. He said that essentially children go through life as little scientists, little detectives, where they're trying to acquire information and actively construct a well-rounded, accurate understanding of the world around them. This is a provocative idea because the idea of children as being actors, active actors in the process of their development was not an idea that was popular at the time. Children were seen as quite passive and just passive receptors of what the environment was sending their way, if they were thought of really at all. According to Piaget, there's going to be four different stages of cognitive development. And each stage is a distinct way of thinking and understanding the world. They are qualitatively different stages of cognitive thinking. In this slide, you see the four stages of cognitive development. So in unit one of this class, we're going to talk about the sensory motor stage from birth to two years old. In the second unit in this class, we're going to talk about pre-operational and concrete operational stages. And in the third unit of this class, we'll talk about the formal operational stage. What you need to know for now is that Piaget also has stages, and these stages are qualitatively different. They are different ways of thinking, and that the child in each of these stages is an active participant in their developing process. Another cognitive approach in this chapter, but also discussed very consistently in educational research. So for any of you guys that want to be teachers or your education majors, you have probably seen this name before. And if you haven't, you'll end up seeing his name quite a bit. So Vygotsky's theory is called the sociocultural cognitive theory. Vygotsky's focus was that culture and social interactions guide and influence cognitive development. Those cultures and those social interactions, especially with skilled peers or teachers and mentors, help a child learn the quote unquote inventions of society, language, math, memory, social rules. And when we have skilled peers or mentors and teachers, they are especially useful in teaching us those conventions and inventions. Now Vygotsky's view and the next view of information processing, there are no stages to either one of these views on this slide. So there are not distinct stages of development. This is continuous. It is gradual and cumulative. Since it's continuous, it's more like a skill that's just getting more finer tuned as you go. The skill is not there or not. The skill is just going from level one to level two to level three. The skill is just becoming more advanced. In the information processing approach, this is a very classic cognitive psychology approach. If you've taken cognitive psychology, you've seen this metaphor, this approach to cognition and thinking and mental processes. In the information processing approach, the metaphor is that your brain is like a computer. It's taking in inputs, processing, storing, configuring, placing, and putting those inputs in particular files, file folders, programs. And later when you need to print something out, you have to access that information and create output. Input, processing, and output are the information processing approach. People take in information, they monitor it, they strategize about it, they process it, they have to store it. 
and they have to respond to it and respond with it. There are no stages in the information processing approach because that information processing is seen as like a speed. So you can have an old computer and maybe a newer computer. The newer computer does the same things, but it does them faster. It has an increasing capacity for processing information. Perceive, encode, represent, store, and retrieve. Those are the active thinking processes of the information processing theory. So to this theory, development is learning better strategies for perceiving, encoding, representing, storing, and retrieving information. And you're getting better and quicker at the capacities for thinking, processing, and being able to respond to new information. Connected with the cognitive approach, we have the social cognitive approaches and also the behavioral approaches. Now, these are two different traditions, essentially, but we're putting them into one, one idea just for the time being to broaden out our understanding of human behavior and mental processes over the lifespan. So both of these approaches have an appreciation for how development can be described in terms of the behaviors learned through interactions with our surroundings. Behaviorism's classic people would be Pavlov, Skinner, Watson. Um, Skinner's operant conditioning has to do with rewards and punishments and that we learn how to behave by either getting rewarded for things or punished for things. Things that are rewarded become more likely to be behaved towards in the future and things that have been punished were less likely to do in the future. So in a purely behavioral sense, rewards and punishments are the reasons that we learn and develop. Broadening this perspective, we have a combination of behaviorism and cognitive theory, and this is brought to us by way of Bandura. This is Bandura's social cognitive theory. This holds that behavior, environment, and the person or their cognitions, they are key factors in human development. So in this model, all of the different factors have the ability to impact one another. Your behavior has an impact on your environment. Your environment can have an impact on your behavior. The person and cognition factors have to do with person could be stuff like internal motivations and personalities and cognition could have to do with your thinking skill, thinking speed, coping strategies, mental processes, memory, memory retrieval, memory storage. So all of those facets and factors in Bandura's model have an impact on how you develop and how you learn to develop over time. In our next approach, we have the ethological approach. Two big names for us here are Lorenz and Bowlby. Now, Lorenz did this study once where he had a group of hatching eggs. Some of them, when they hatched, they saw their mother goose for the first time, and they were hatched right there with their mom. And the other eggs, when they were hatched, the first figure they saw was him. What happened is the geese that were hatched to him followed him around like a mama goose. And the geese that were hatched to their own mother followed their mother around. So if their mother walked this way, they followed that. So it was really cute. You can see that they followed him around like a daddy duck. If he was swimming, they went swimming. If he was in the house, they walked into the house. They followed him. They imprinted to him. This is biologically imprinting. This is a critical period of attachment that determines a preset pattern for survival. And this research leads us to discussions of things like sensitive periods, critical periods, and imprinting. Later on, Bowlby, and we're going to talk even more about Bowlby when we start talking about attachment. Bowlby was a psychiatrist and psychologist, and he was working with kids that were having some issues, some behavioral issues. And he was interested in seeing the disruptions and attachment that were frequent among the kids that were having some criminal issues or behavior issues. So he was 
interested in this idea of secure attachment or a secure base. And what he found is that attachment to a caregiver over the first year of life has tremendously important consequences throughout the lifespan for that individual. He also did some research with orphans and people that had been deprived of maternal touch and maternal affection and followed them later and saw some of their difficulties, tremendous difficulties later in life. And so both perspectives tell us a little bit about how the important early experiences are to later development. And that gives us a heart behind ethological theory. Your book also talks about the ecological approach. This approach has a good appreciation for culture, context, and the individual, all the levels of context and contextual influences that surround an individual and influence their development. You'll also find on page 25 of your textbook, a good little chart that has a review of these perspectives. All in all, many of these theories have pieces of tremendous worth for us as developmental researchers. And many developmental researchers, as developmental and lifespan research is multidisciplinary, use many different backgrounds in order to understand patterns, behaviors, and thinking processes over the lifespan. So it's really not whether one theory is right or wrong. It really is about applying these different insights to different questions about human behavior and mental processes over the lifespan. Well, I'm so proud of what you've done here today, and I'm so excited to have class with you this semester. Here at the end of the chapter, I just want to thank you for your time and attention and remind you that I'm excited to work with you. If you have any questions about the syllabus or the class order or discussion posts or the papers or really anything that we're doing, email me. We can find a time, we can connect. It's my job to make sure that you feel comfortable and edified in this class. So where are we going from here? In our next chapter, we'll be talking about prenatal development and the beginning moments of life. In order for you to prepare for this chapter, if you can, I'd really, really love for you to find a picture of you as a baby. If you could talk to your mom or a family member or a caregiver or someone that might have some of those pictures, I want you to find one of those pictures and talk to your caregiver about what you were like as a baby. It'll make the content of the next chapter make so much more sense if you have a personal example right next to you as you learn it. So find that adorable baby picture, get ready for a great week to come, and I'll catch you next time. Good job, everybody.